one and two, one, two, three, four. They called him the Atomic Howard Singer, Elvis Presley. So what if mom and dad thought he was from outer space? Elvis was the king of rock and roll, and he was here to save the world from the aging crooners and total squares who ran the show. And when he hit the big screen, wide-eyed teens packed theaters to catch a glimpse of their idol. They saw Elvis sing, they saw Elvis dance, but they had yet to see him rock. At the time that Elvis began his film career, rock and roll was seen as something that was a fad that was very shortly going to pass into oblivion. It was seen as something that was almost beneath contempt. Rock and roll was sort of the province of teen movies. It was the Blackboard Jungle where Rock Around the Clock pops up. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. The way you saw rock songs in the movie was, oh, uh, it's very nice to meet you, Mr. Jones. The kids are having a dance and they've hired a band. They've got a little song and it goes something like this. You did have rock and rollers popping up in film, but it's presented as a novelty. There was no integration to the script. There was no idea of presenting a story particularly. It's not the same as what you're going to see in Jailhouse Rock, where you're building the movie around the rock star, where you're building the sequences around the songs, where the whole movie revolves around rock and roll. It was the first attempt at trying to do that with rock and roll. And, you know, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it with a king. I mean, at that point, there was one guy who was capable of doing that, and that was the guy who did it. They wouldn't really have done anything like that for anybody else. But because it was Elvis, because he had shown such success in his movies, there was a sense of, OK, let's take it one more step. In his first two pictures, Love Me Tender and Loving You, Elvis played the confused youth. He played the nice guy. For Jailhouse Rock, the approach was simpler. Get some rock into the role. This is a movie about Elvis Presley becoming Elvis Presley, right? So this is a movie about a guy learning to sing and dance and becoming a rock star. With Jailhouse Rock, it's kind of a parable of Elvis's own rise to fame. And it's also the whole rebel theme. The character of Vince Everett played off of a lot of people's ideas of the 50s rebel, the guy with attitude and a chip on his shoulder. Ah! Elvis had great ambitions to do the kind of acting that James Dean had done. Basically, his whole commitment was to a kind of method acting. And Elvis ate that up, and he became that character for a while, the Vince Everett character. He would act a little tough back at the hotel. He'd be a little on edge. At that time, we thought he was really mad, but then it as I look back on actually, he was just trying to stay in character. The part was a good fit. What Elvis needed next was a song, not a ballad to make them swoon, but a true rock and roll song to make them sweat. Jailhouse Rock was written by two of the best songwriters who were working with Elvis at that point, Lieber and Stoller. These guys were the sharpest writing team going on in the world at that time. And so he couldn't wait to get material from Mike Stiller and Jerry Lieber. But Lieber and Stiller were very reluctant to write for the movie. They had written almost exclusively for rhythm and blues artists, and they saw Elvis as this kind of Johnny-come-lately, and they despised his version of Hound Dog. They felt like, you know, they'd written this good blues song, and here was this white guy turning it into a tongue-in-cheek rock and roll song, How Dare He. Hound Dog, I thought was a mess. And I think Mike shared my opinion. He did not sing that song the way it was written. The fact that it was a hit was mind boggling. After it sold at that time about seven million records, we began to see the merit of it. <laughs> Despite being sold on the King's star power, Lieber and Stola remained cynical. They headed to New York for inspiration but found the nightlife more stimulating than writing songs for Jailhouse. The studio suits were getting anxious. So Gene Aberbach, a music executive, paid the writing duo a visit to provide a little motivation. I said, hey, Gene, what's doing? He said, I came for my songs. I think Jerry said to him, well, don't worry, Gene, you're going to have them. He said, I know. And he put a big overstuffed chair in front of the door, our only exit from the suite, and said, I'm going to take a nap. And when you have the songs written, 
he'd wake me up. We didn't even look at the script till he came in and sat in front of the door. Nevertheless, when Aberbach awoke a mere four hours later, the boys had written four tunes. I Wanna Be Free, Treat Me Nice, You're So Square Baby I Don't Care, and the title track, Jailhouse Rock. Not too shabby for an afternoon's work, and Jailhouse is a standout. Jailhouse Rock is almost a tongue-in-cheek kind of a song with all kinds of hidden meaning. I put a couple of lines in Jailhouse Rock that were a little edgy, but uh, nobody complained, and they went down. Freddie Beanstalk, who ran Elvis's publishing company for him in New York City, would bring the demos down and playing for Elvis. When we played Jailhouse Rock, Elvis looked at me, and I said, Elvis, what a great song. Little Richard would give his right arm for this. He said, yeah, but he ain't getting it. I'm cutting it. <laughs> and he did cut it, man. Lieber and Stoller were very skeptical of Elvis at first, but during Jailhouse Rock, they came to respect him in a way that I think surprised even them. As they got to know Elvis, Lieber and Stoller were impressed with the way that he embraced a song, the way that he added passion to a song. The thing that was remarkable about Elvis's approach was that he played Jailhouse Rock absolutely straight. This was the thing that set Lieber and Stoller back, in a sense. He didn't want to sound pretty or smooth on that song. He just wanted to sing it. He gives it everything he's got and really sells that song. On Jailhouse Rock, we knew that we had a hit record, Take Nine. I mean, Elvis said, I think I can do it better. And he kept going, and we were up to close to 29 or 30 or something like that. Jailhouse Rock was a hard song to sing, and that is why in the studio there at Radio Recorders in Hollywood, Elvis sang the song halfway, and then he stopped and got his breath. Then he picked it up at the instrumental bridge in the middle of the song, and they spliced it together. He had an innate greatness, actually, to his voice. He was like an Olympic performer. He could sing until everybody in the band dropped. It's a very raw, primal piece of music that still jumps out of the car radio. It was one of his strongest songs because he still had something to prove. In the motion picture business, there was an enormous antagonistic view towards him when he came in. And there was a resentment because they didn't know him, they just knew the image. And in those days, as weird as it sounds, there was resentment towards this, whatever he was doing with his hips. Elvis Presley on stage, in these years, he shakes his hips, he swivels his hips. You know, so he becomes a physical representation of rock and roll. The way Elvis moved was so foreign to what anybody else had ever seen at the time. He was often criticized for it because it was considered to be lewd and Lascivious. There's a sexuality at the heart of it, obviously, but there's also something else. I think it more, had more to do with the expression of raw energy. It's like limitless energy. This energy, this abandon, would ultimately help breathe life into Jailhouse Rock's pivotal dance sequence, in spite of the King's naysayers. The story always is that Elvis choreographed that number. And the reality is a little more complicated than that. Elvis wasn't excited at all about the dance sequence in Jailhouse Rock. He was dreading it. He didn't want to do that dance sequence because he was not a real professional type dancer. And the uh, choreographer for Jailhouse Rock, Alex Romero, he went into the idea of staging this scene with the same approach that he had taken to other musicals he had done. I'll never forget the first day we went over to the rehearsal hall. Alex played the song Jailhouse Rock and he showed Elvis what he wanted Elvis to do. Elvis got up and he said, Alex, I'm sorry, I'm not Fred Astaire. I'm not Gene Kelly, that's not me. I would do anything you want me to do, but I just can't do that. And so the choreographer was smart enough to say, okay, let's see what is you. He gave Elvis a microphone. He said, Elvis, sing along with the record here in this little room and here nobody will see us, and just show me what movements you have on stage. So he watched Elvis dance to a few of his records, and then he said, okay, I've got it. You got it? What do you mean you got it? And he says, listen, I'll have it for you tomorrow. And so the next day, we go back to the rehearsal hall. Alex Romero got up and did that dance that you saw Elvis perform in Jill House Rock. And Elvis said, hey, that's me. I can do that. I mean, it wasn't dreaded anymore because he was moving more naturally. He saw it as a manner of expressing himself. He was totally excited that his own act 
was, in a sense, enlarged in this other sphere. Elvis was so fired up that he showed off his new moves to pal Russ Tamblin, an accomplished dancer who would go on to star in West Side Story. Elvis called him back into the dressing room and showed him how he had developed those moves. He wouldn't have shown that to anybody else. It was a private moment, but it was something which uh, Elvis was proud of. I noticed that he had great rhythm, and he had a few things that he did, especially with his legs. Well, I'd never seen that step before. That was really his. But being a dancer, I think I knew I could help him just to get him a little sharper. But I just got him to throw it in harder and faster. And he did change. He did accent the knees a little more. The one thing about Jailhouse Rock, since it's the title number in this movie showcasing all of us, it had a lot of pressure on it in the sense that everybody wanted it to be really a kickoff. It was planned as the first sequence we would do, well ahead of principal photography. With the steps a lock, Elvis and the dancing cons gathered on the soundstage for the big scene. But as Elvis dug his heels into the dance number, he would shake things loose in more ways than one. In fact, Elvis dislodged a cosmetic cap on his front tooth and inhaled it. And I realized that when he talked, he was whistling. So we took him to Cedars. And the first thing the doctor said, it's a very simple procedure. He'll be a little strange sounding for a couple of weeks, but there's no damage done. It kind of parallels in the movie when he's, you know, hitting the throat by Hunk. I told you I don't want to fight you, do you hear? <laughs> and they don't know whether he's going to have his voice back. So there's an interesting real life parallel that goes along with that. Like Vince Everett in the film, Elvis quickly bounced back. The rebel rocker returned to the soundstage, determined to tear it up, as only he could. We're in a world of the 50s. When you look back now, it's pretty tame compared to what we see on MTV or VH1. Put it in the context of Eisenhower, who's still president, people were doing the hokey pokey in schools. People were dancing cheek to cheek. And we're in a world at the moment that wants to bust out really hard. If you're a kid, it's like, oh my god, I did not know that I could do that with my body. You gotta remember, he moved around by himself three years before the twist was invented, which was the first time that people stopped dancing with each other and started moving around by themselves. It's the ultimate defiant gesture. It's a dance sequence in a jail. People are captive in prison. But the fact is, the song, the choreography, and Elvis turned it into a celebration. There's not much that's realistic about it. There are bars, it's suggestive of prison, but it's more like, let's have fun. It's a Busby Berkeley take on jail with the dancing girls, dancing cons instead. Rock and roll started out as an expression of just pure joy. It was just a feeling of release. And that is really at the heart of the dance sequence in Jailhouse Rock. It is literally about the kind of freedom that Elvis delivered to the entire country. The Jailhouse Rock sequence itself was the most elaborately choreographed, most grandiose production number that there had been with a rock and roll song. It had been done in musicals, but those weren't rock and roll songs. It would have been something completely new to audiences in 1957. This was a major movie. It signaled people could not just hear the song, but they could watch it as well. You're going to see Michael Jackson cop some of these moves in videos and on stage, up on his toes, seeming to levitate in midair for a second. But the first guy who was able to do that was Elvis. The dance sequence in Jailhouse Rock for Elvis Presley really had him accepted by the world as far as, hey, this guy's more than just a singer. He's more than just an actor. He can dance, too. The Jailhouse Rock scene is a high point in Elvis's career. And the reason I say that is I've never seen an actor enjoying a scene like Elvis enjoyed that. I mean, he was all smiles, tooth and all. Most of the moments that we really associate with Elvis, the looks and the poses, don't come from his movies. But that one's certainly up there near the top of the list. And it continues to pop up when people think about putting rock and roll on film. The Jailhouse Rock sequence truly shook the foundations of Hollywood. 
In those few iconic moments, Elvis made us believe that rock was a force to be reckoned with. And he set us free. <laughs>